you know, there was a change. One, I had to get out of that spin cycle of using the alcohol to cope. But it wasn't until I could sit there and figure out and gain the courage till I was kind of level with myself that I could talk to her and say, like, you think it's about the job. It's not about the job. Mm. The job isn't going to fix what I need fixing um, to understand that how my identity was so tied up in that and that, you know, an identity had been torn all the way down to the ground and needed to be rebuilt mm. because that question hadn't been asked. I never give up. I never give up. I never give up. Hi folks, welcome back to Neff Inspiration, my show on YouTube and as a podcast with me, your host, Stefan Neff. Today I've got Richard Kraft with me. Richard is an amazing man who, like so many other humans out there, has given his heart, his soul, his life to his profession in healthcare. And then one day the pandemic hit. And as with so many people out there, it had devastating consequences and many people lost their profession, lost their work, lost their identity because so often we are combining everything into one. And Richard, like me in the past, we were the biggest problems for ourselves because yeah, external validation and incorporating our our profession into our deepest meaning of life uh, can have devastating consequences. So Richard, welcome to my show. Thank you for having me. What was your passion? What was your, your profession? Well, so for probably about 15 years in healthcare, initially I started off in the early 2000s. I worked in an emergency room as a registration clerk and really enjoyed that. And that kind of led me to go back to school. Mm -hmm. And I thought I wanted to be a physician. And um, while I was in undergrad, I was actually volunteering at the hospital as well, um, trying to build up some of that kind of community service type stuff, because medical schools really look highly on that. Mm -hmm. But it was through taking healthcare law, I realized I didn't really want to be a physician. There was so many laws and so many things that seemed to tie the hands of physicians um, of being the type of physician they really wanted to be. So I kind of ended up in with a health and kinesiology degree. I ended up as a personal trainer. So I was kind of always into helping people. And mm. I did that for a little bit, but it seemed too much salesy. So then I kind of went back to the emergency room and it was there that I would say I started this 12 year period that I didn't necessarily choose healthcare, but I felt like healthcare chose me. And it was in that level one trauma center that six years working as a senior clerk, the only non clinical person among all the clinical people. Um, they compared me to radar on MASH. So essentially, I'm your guy who gets things done, everything in between that's not medical related. And so I did that for a while, and because it was kind of this singular role, um, I didn't really, there was nowhere up or laterally to grow, and I needed to grow at that time, and my wife said, well, why don't you apply to graduate school? Um, maybe you can go into healthcare management, and mm -hmm. so I found a 15-month program and ended up applying and got in and started my route to healthcare management, and it was while I was actually in that program that I received an offer to become a healthcare manager. I was also a new father of a one-year-old daughter and also in the middle of graduate school. So I had all these things kind of converge at once and I packed up my family still in grad school, still learning how to kind of properly be a manager. And I was kind of, thrown into the deep end of healthcare management, um, where, you know, it was a lot of learning, a lot of uh, tough times, a lot of long nights, uh, weekends in the office, learning to do different things. But it was kind of a sweet spot because I was in graduate school and I was learning on the job. So I was kind of able to 
um, put things into practice real time. And of course, there's always a little bit of difference between theory, textbook, and practical. But you know, the the training and the education was really great and beneficial to me. And then, you know, kind of once I got that 15 months, it took me about two years, I feel like, to really get my feet underneath me um, as a leader. But, you know, then I just continued to uh, be a healthcare manager where I had two ambulatory clinics with family practice, urgent care, visiting specialties. And, you know, they were in separate locations. But, you know, my passion became, you know, not only serving patients and ensuring that they got the best care possible, but also as a leader, it really became about serving your team um, because I had 26 direct reports that were clinicians. Um, you know, we had nurses, we had medical assistants, front desk, and then I had 10 providers that were a mix of physician assistants, physicians, mm. and nurse practitioners. And so, you know, I think as a healthcare leader, it, it your role definitely, it takes on this whole different meaning when you're also a leader to the people who are serving the patients. And mm. it's almost like they become your children and you're very much invested in them because, you know, everything from their personal life to um, their professional life can mm -hmm. impact how they show up and, you know, how they show up determines how well we take care of the patients and mm -hmm. how well we do. And for, you know, people who don't know these, um, these kinds of things is that, mm -hmm. you know, there's this theory of why good service matters in a healthcare environment and, you know, there's this theory that if you receive great service from our clinicians and you have a great experience, you're more likely to be compliant. And with compliance, if you're taking your medicine and doing everything that the doctor's asking you, then you're also, you know, you're going to be healthier. Mm -hmm. Insurance is going to have to pay less. But then also globally, you think of it kind of as a, um, you know, we we make the world a healthier place therefore there's less health care costs associated mm. with long-term care and so in and with this these kinds of customer service experience things this mm. is what hospitals and healthcare organizations also use mm. to negotiate reimbursement rates so if you can show that you take better care of your patients that your patients are more compliant mm then you stand to get paid a little bit better from the insurance companies making it a little bit better. So there's, you know, so there's some financial incentive, of course, but there's also the incentive of compliance and healthier patients mm. and healthier people and kind of a better world. So, you know, when you start looking at all these different things as a leader, you're you because you know because your identity is so wrapped up into caring for people because you know as healthcare people it's not what we do for a living it's yeah. kind of who we are we choose that profession because we want to help people we want to make a difference and so it's very easy to have your identity and your profession co-mingled and wrapped up together and when something like the pandemic happened it it can be very devastating because you know essentially it's ripping away who you are not just what you do because it'd be a difference if i work yeah. um making hamburgers at mcdonald's and all of a sudden i was non-essential well, my identity, that was just kind of something I did to make some money, you know, unless I'm a professional chef mm -hmm. and your identity is tied up in being a chef, then, you know, that wouldn't be as devastating. And so I really think that why the pandemic and why being laid off was so devastating to me was because, you know, if you go back and you look at it, you know, I got laid off in 2020 and it was probably around the 2002 
time frame. So 18 years ago that I worked in that mm. first emergency room, or it might have even been 2001. Mm. So 18, 19 years that I had decided on some sort of profession of caring for people mm. that I had had that initial experience and that, oh, I'm going to be a doctor and then kind of decided against it, but went into yeah. personal training, mm. but still found my way back into a level one trauma center mm. and then into management. So, you know, it, it's not really that hard to fathom that one's identity could be so tied up into that because, you know, that seed was planted 18, 19 years ago before actually mm. being laid off. Mm. And so, that kind of being a wanting to be a caretaker mm. of some sort um, really resonated with me as to who I was, mm. not necessarily what I did. And, you know, mm. that led to a lot of fulfillment, but, you know, with every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And so, if you can gain a lot of fulfillment for something, then that means the disappointment um can also be equally on the opposite side of the spectrum mm. that's beautiful and you are not alone there aren't you because so many of us are giving 100 percent, actually 110 120 percent we stay longer because we really believe in what we are doing we are really so enmeshed as persons as humans into our profession into our work that it is uh, sometimes incredibly hard to tease apart that I was in the past when I was asked, well, Stefan, who are you? And I said, well, I'm a pain physician. No, 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 Stefan, you, you, who are you? I, I just told you I'm a pain physician. I'm a doctor. Yeah, I could not distinguish that. And it is, I, I burned out in that aspect of medicine and uh, ended up um, actually drinking far too much alcohol, a story that, res <laughs> that resounds with you. Uh, we will talk about that shortly. Uh, and I ended up in rehab and, and the decision was there that I will not go back to pain medicine. I was lost. I was lost yeah. for quite some time and there is grief and there is grief and loss are really resentment, anger, all those negative emotions. How did you cope with them? Man, poorly, 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 poorly. <laughs> Much like you, um, alcohol was one of the ways and um, I actually took some Kratom as well. Um, but, you know, for me, there was, you know, so you get laid off and everything's kind of fine for a little bit. You get a severance package and, you know, you have a little bit of breathing room, the pandemic's still going, nobody really knows what's going on. So you're kind of in limbo a little bit and it, it's not as bad then you're not really thinking about too much, but it wasn't really until I started maybe going back out and looking for jobs again that I, I feel like the real pain and poor decision making kind of kicked in for me. Mm -hmm. And it was essentially, you know, one, I was going back looking at healthcare jobs. Mm -hmm. But not understanding at the time that I really didn't want them. Um, mm -hmm. I really wasn't ready to go back into that. And then it was also, you know, I had interviewed places and the offers weren't good. You know, they wanted me to move five hours away from my home and further away from my, my family. And I just wasn't willing to do it. And they wanted to pay me less than I was making when I got laid off. And I, I couldn't do that. I was just like, no, this is not for me. And, and it became this process of, you know, when I was looking for the employment and either not getting stuff when I knew I was qualified or seeing a lot of places that, you know, they would say, no, we don't want to hire you. They hire somebody else. And then less than a year later, the position's posted again. Hmm. 
And all I'm wanting to do is work. And it was really during that time, that frustration that really led me to drinking because I was lost because, you know, there was something inside of me that I knew, like I, I never lost who I was in terms of, I knew I wanted to help people. I knew I wanted to make a difference, but I was lost in terms of going, you know, well, this is not the only way to do it. And these doors aren't opening because these doors aren't for you. And I hadn't really come to any of this kind of realization yet. Mm. And because of that, you know, when you're lost and you feel a certain way, you typically, I would turn to the bottle and I would drink because I needed to kind of shut my brain down. I needed to go, you know, that was the only way I could kind of get any relief to get to sleep, to turn my mind off mm. was pretty much to drink. And then I started kind of taking some Kratom and, you know, for people unfamiliar with that, it's, it's like a tea leaf kind of, it's cousin to the coffee bean, but it acts, it attaches to your opioid receptors. Mm -hmm. And so that, even though it's legal and you can buy it in gas stations and smoke shops, um, you know, that was horrible for me. It was creating another addiction and mm. you know before you know it you you have two things that you're struggling with and the crazy thing for me was you know okay I could take the kratom and I didn't feel I didn't feel the desire to drink but then that kratom would sit in and the only way I could get over the slight withdrawal from the kratom attaching to your opioid receptors was to drink to ease the pain and so it was like this vicious cycle and so if you oh, look no. at my quit or sobriety dates they're very close together and that's kind of the reason why was i would you i was going in this vicious cycle of one or the other using one to get off the other if i needed one i didn't need the other but you know i wasn't doing myself any good and yeah. man it was it was it was a very, very difficult time. And oh. I just think about some of the things I did, some of the things I said just because I was so lost, broken, hurt. Um it it's it's kind of like a manic blur in a way. Like I, I remember a lot of it. I remember the pain, but mm. I've really you know, while I remember it, I don't really identify with it. I don't identify with that person who was in that period because that person was such a different person. That was not me. That was that was somebody who <laughs> felt like they got picked up by a tornado in China Throne, <laughs> if that makes sense. And I think if anybody's ever been in this kind of predicament, and understands this dog chasing their tail kind of roller coaster of addiction, um, they'll be able to relate that you, you know, you you're so out of control and you think that the answer is getting more out of control. <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't make sense when you look at it that way, but that's the easiest way to explain it is, you know, you feel, you feel lost because you feel like, Hey, this is something I can't control. There's all these circumstances, but then for whatever reason, your brain goes, man, I'm so up in arms about stuff. I can't control. Let me go drink and get more out of control mm -hmm. to where you really have no grasp. Your brain really is not thinking clearly and it's really not going to comprehend um what it is you're looking for what mm -hmm. you're lost from mm -hmm. that's interesting what you're saying because the i am exactly in the same position i i believe that i have grown so much because i did 
a lot of work. I was privileged to have all this trauma, including in, in very recent times. And I'm, I guess I, I was grateful for the choice and I chose the right things. I didn't choose more pain, more suffering, but I chose uh, in recent months to really work on some of the, the the things that happen deep inside. How can we distinguish between you just saying, no, nah, I don't want to be responsible for that. That was in the past. Um, forget about it. That's no longer me, uh, i.e. not taking ownership versus to say, actually, I have taken ownership and I am actively accepting what I have done. How can we distinguish these two? For me, I think just coming on to a podcast and having my own podcast, mm. admitting, and that's the ownership, admitting to the world, admitting to other people, um, putting it out there for that one person who needs to hear it Beautiful. today, who needs to hear this conversation. Mm. Um, that's the owning it is I'm out there for everybody to take their shot and say, oh, he, he was a bad person. Yes, I was a bad person. But, you know, I think if you were to look at that person and look at the same person now mm -hmm. and you met that person and you've met me now, you, you would know that's not the same person. But, you know, I definitely, you know, part of having a podcast and being open and being vulnerable is, you know, I know that there's a genetic component to this. And I have two sides of the family that both have, be it alcohol or opiate mm -hmm. or any kind of drug problem. And so, you know, with young children, I'm hoping to you know, thwart, thwart that, stave it off, give some words, hopefully that they can hear it, or it's always going to be here. This conversation's always going to be here for my daughter to go back and listen to. Mm -hmm. If she needs to understand maybe why she feels the way she does, why she is the way she is, mm -hmm. she can look at me. And, you know, and that's that accountability piece is putting it all out there because, you know, having worked in a level one trauma center. Mm -hmm. And even during the pandemic, you know, I've lost two nurses who used to work for me and understanding how precious life is, is, mm -hmm. you know, I know I won't be around forever. And so in the event that it's untimely or, you know, we can't control it. So I want to make sure that whatever it is I have to say or whatever valuable lessons or pain I've experience that I could keep other people and or my daughter from experiencing, then um, I want to do it. Beautiful. And I think that is, uh, there are several real golden nuggets there that you had mentioned. One is you said you described yourself as a bad man. I beg to differ. I would say you're not a bad man. You're a man who has done bad things. I think that is a huge difference. It is good to show extreme ownership and be responsible for what we have done. Absolutely, 100%. The, however, to, to say we are bad is means really that this is a statement. This is a fact. This is something that we can't do anything about. And I, I don't think that this is true. We can Makes change. Sense. The past does not equal the future. So I don't think you're a bad man, but you have done bad things and things that you regret and things that yes. have caused you shame, guilt and further pain. But you also took the ownership and actually accepted that and are now trying to make amends. And that is so beautiful. As far as your relationship with your children are concerned, no doubt when we are in pain, 
we often are not the best parents. We often are real beep holes. Um, and it is, I'm certainly not proud of those times. But what I can be proud of nowadays, even if there is a genetic predisposition in my children, even if from my ancestors we have handed down some not so nice genes, there is still the fact that they have also seen me transform, me dealing with different trauma, dealing with different life challenges in good ways and bad ways. So I think my children are actually gifted because they are probably far more likely to seek help compared with other adult children of alcoholics who have not seen their parents changing have not seen better coping mechanisms, uh, different ways of adapting to challenges. Uh, the sheer fact that I nowadays try to feel my emotions and I'm open about them. I'm no longer trying to escape from them and push them away, but rather actually model that it is okay to feel sad, to feel angry, to feel the whole rainbow of emotions that is out there. I think that is a gift that we can give to our children. And I think that is what you're doing. So therefore, there are actually a lot of positive things that are coming out of this, this enlightenment, out of this awareness. So uh, my kudos, I mean, head off to you, brother. I mean, you're doing an amazing job there. But it is hard. It is hard on you. It's hard on your family. How did your wife cope with that? Hmm. Patiently, I guess you could say she's a, she's a trooper. You know, it was, I think, I think for her, initially the pain point was always the job. Like you need the job. You need to go back to your job. You have this degree, you're not using it. You need this job. And so that point of contention, it was always about the job mm. and never about me as the person who felt betrayed by an organization mm. who laid me off during a time and ripped my identity away. And, and so it was worse. It really perpetuated the, the drinking on my part. And it really wasn't until I stopped drinking and started pushing forward and sitting with those emotions that I was able to explain to her, and this is still a process that's ongoing, um, I was able to explain to her kind of what I needed from her um, that you know, whatever it was I'm feeling and trying to deal with, it's it's not going to be fixed by getting a job. That wasn't the answer. Um, I felt my identity had been ripped away. Then I'd cope poorly. I essentially needed to rebuild who I was. I needed to figure out I wasn't Richard Kraft practice manager of these two clinics anymore. Mm. I needed to figure out who Richard Kraft was the man. And, you know, and so, like I said, it's still ongoing, but teaching her that this is what I have to do, but the support I need is I don't need for you to fix anything for me. This is not what I'm after. Mm -hmm. All I need from you is to love me, to try to understand this, to, I'm not, you know, don't fix it. Just let me sit in the emotion. I need to. Um, yes, we can try to talk about it. We can whatever, but it, it's still been this ongoing process and it mm. it's still kind of being fine-tuned because I'm just now even learning myself of, you know, when I would get in a funk, in a mental funk, um, as I've tried to sort out emotions, I would isolate, self-isolate. And you know, the other day, I kind of, it was about a week ago, I had an instance where 
I kind of, this was coming on and I felt myself starting to self-isolate, but we were kind of in a family setting, but we were two vehicles and I was like, Hey, I need to go Uber a little bit and clear my mind and sit with some thoughts. And so I'm just now learning how to distinguish the fact of self-isolation and actually um, kind of pro-choice taking that moment to sit in the pain and figure out because, you know, what I've started to learn is you have to really ask yourself when you feel a certain way, why do I feel this way at the core? It probably wasn't what somebody said or what somebody did that brought the emotion up. It's probably something that's been in there. And so through this process, mm -hmm. you know, like I took that moment away and my wife gave me the space. And so it's kind of as I'm learning more, I'm telling her more about what I need. Mm -hmm. And she's able to better support me. But I would say, especially for any man out there, communication is not our strong point. That it's it's been hard for me to open up and tell my wife these things. Hey, I'm not okay. Even though she's, we've been together 18 years and she's the closest person to me. I still, I don't know if it makes me feel less than a, a man, a provider, a husband or whatever, but you know, there's some sort of block that, that I'm not telling the person closest to me, mm. how they can love and support me, but I'm learning and it, it's getting better. And I would say to any man out there, that's kind of the first step is, you know, if you want that person who's supposed to be your number one, the closest person to you to support you, mm. then you have to talk to them. You have to tell them what you need. They're not mind readers. They're people just like us. Mm. Um, you know, they have their own things going on. Um, so, but yeah, it's it's gotten better kind of as I've learned more. It's been kind of a collaboration. And I think she's starting to understand that. And I think it helps her to feel a little bit more safe and in control as well. Now that she knows that what I expect and that expectation doesn't include fixing anything, mm. you know, because if somebody doesn't know what to do for you, then they feel like out of control and then they don't feel great about it. So it's like if they know the expectation, hey, he's just in a bad mood and he'll talk to me when he's ready and mm. all I need to do is love him and support him and give him the space, then mm. um, then they know exactly what they need to do and they can feel okay with that when it happens. So it's very important to communicate to your mm. significant other, I would say. Mm. Hugely so, hugely so. And I think if I if I look back, one of my biggest failures uh, truly in my marriage uh, was effective communication. Um, I was a workaholic and I uh, escaped tough discussions. I escaped into my work, um, which is from a societal point of view, highly encouraged. Look at him. He is such an overachiever. Look at him. What a man. Yeah, He's a great provider. Exactly. And we can always sort of uh, fall back onto that. But the moment you're saying, hey, I deserve respect because I bring the money in. The moment you, you are saying that, take that as a big signal that probably there is something seriously wrong there. Um, why do you not feel that you're getting the respect? Because probably you're not communicating at a level that is effective. And you're clearly not uh, fulfilling the needs of your family. Let that be as a parent or let that be as a husband. And that is something that I've only learned far too late. And it is a hard lesson to learn. I was going to say too, with 18 years, things change and you mm. go in and out of different versions of yourself and the relationship. And so, mm. um, you know, you said the hard way. I'm thankful that we made it through all that. <laughs> I'm so pleased for you, man. I'm so pleased because it's really hard because here you are with your own pain that is that is building up deep inside. And now you're opening up to your your uh, husband, wife, spouse, significant other. And uh, suddenly that person 
might respond in a really grateful way that you're opening up, but the flip side might occur. And he or she might say, actually, I can't deal with that. I'm so in panic. I'm so distressed myself. And now, now you're, you're wincing here and you're, you're, you're weak and pathetic like that. Now I need you to be strong. I need you to be the man. Um, bloody hell. What would you have said had that occurred? Hmm, man. Well, I think we probably tried that a couple of times and it didn't work. I think it probably <laughs> led to me um, drinking more and doing and saying some things that were hurtful or shameful mm -hmm. on my part. Mm -hmm. And and that kind of brings me to that point of when, you know, there was a change. One, I had to get out of that spin cycle of using the alcohol to cope but it wasn't until i could sit there and figure out and gain the courage till i was kind of level with myself that i could talk to her and say like you think it's about the job it's not about the job mm. the job isn't going to fix what i need fixing um to understand that how my identity was so tied up in that and that you know an identity had been torn all the way down to the ground and needed to be rebuilt mm -hmm. because that question hadn't been asked in so long. And, you know, trying to get, once I was able to kind of get that understood and then also sometimes it, it takes logic. Sometimes you have to go like, okay, has my lack of work? Cause you know, I decided to Uber on the side, but it's like, has my lack of work prevented you from doing any of the things that you wanted to do? Do we have our basic needs met? Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the benefits? Like how much time am I getting to spend with my daughter? How much time am I getting to take her to school, um, pick her up from school, attend school events? There's so many things that weren't accounted for when I was working all the time, the 2 a.m. phone calls, the, you know, doing work while you're on vacation, um, whether it's emails, no matter what it is, yeah. but, you know, yeah. kind of using some of that logic and explaining that, okay, there's a lot of good that has happened. And, you know, when the right role comes along, that door will open. And I'm not necessarily going to go back to what I did before. And that was kind of a hard thing too, was, you know, I even just to kind of prove like, I'm, I'm not afraid of it. I applied back to the same organization that laid me mm. off for a similar position. Mm. And it was like a no, but the, the whole thing was, was like, it was kind of like discovering that that was an old you and you need to become a new you and new you may not. I knew that wasn't what I wanted, but it was kind of like having to prove that they're not going to hire me anyway. So what should it matter? Um, to prove to them, like to prove to my wife, like, Hey, look, those kinds of jobs, they're just not interested in me anymore. So mm. I need to do something else. And so when you factor all those things in and you're able to kind of show like, um, I shouldn't be doing this and maybe I should be doing this and there's mm -hmm. some value and we're, we still have everything we need. Then kind of all of it together was the statement, but mm -hmm. you know, all that came you know, it seems like it's so short and so simple, but it took such a long time to <laughs> sit, understand, figure out yeah. and communicate it. And that's why I say, like, if you look at 18 years, um, some some of the last ones were very rough, but we made it through and. You know, so brilliant, I'm very brilliant. thankful. <laughs> oh, you're so right. The communication is so important. 
But yeah. it's also there is so much growth involved because how often do we actually communicate effectively? Many of us don't know. Many of us don't realize that there are love languages, that there are ways that bring the best out, out of the other person uh, by actually addressing their needs, by recognizing that they have needs and then effectively dealing with them. Some people are more kinesthetic, they, they need touch, others need acts of service, others need to be told, others need to be shown. There's so many ways for one person to do a an act of service means the world to them and the other person says, what the hell are you doing? Um, yeah. So it's, there is, again, communication is so important and self work, uh, looking really deep inside yourself and figuring out your own needs. Because uh, communication, you can talk until your lips bleed. If you don't actually know what you need, what is going on within yourself, it can be such a challenge. Now, well, you... that was kind of the understanding of knowing that rebuilding myself and figuring out who I was was only going to come from me. It was nothing she could give me or do. Hmm. What tools did you utilize to get yourself through the tough times? Wow. A lot of podcasts. I would say probably one of the key moments was I started listening to this podcast that Stop Drinking Coach with Bardia Rez, I want to say. There was this approach that I had listened to this podcast. I don't know how I came across it. But once I understood what it was doing to my brain mm. and because I knew I felt depressed, I knew I didn't feel right. And whenever, you know, he explained, you're basically seeking dopamine hits mm. and you're, you know, you're redlining your dopamine and like an RPM, you're getting way 200 more times than you really need to get. And that's what you love. Mm. Well, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction mm. and you're getting minus 200 the next day. And that's Correct. what's causing that depression. Yeah. And to get back just to level was taking, you know, it takes too long for most people. So mm. by, you know, you're getting near zero, maybe by the end of the day, and then you're reaching for another drink because mm. you know that that's going to take you back to 200 and you're going to feel better. And you're like, oh, you're redlining again. And once I started listening to that and I understood what it was doing to my brain, I I said, I have to stop and I have to, I have to know what my baseline is, hmm. you know, and at this point in time, I was figuring out who I was. So I was kind of at a point where I was so tired of being sick and tired that hmm. I was willing to sit with it. And I knew I needed an extended period of time. I knew I needed to come up to baseline and then I needed to have some time to feel what baseline was actually like. Mm. And only then would I be able to start making kind of some progress. And so it was kind of understanding that continuing listening to the podcast, kind of educating myself you know, and then listening to other ones that were very similar in nature, listening to other people's stories, how they overcame it. Mm. And then I started walking daily, um, sometimes twice a day, listen to podcasts mm. like support. And then a lot of journaling, a lot of journaling about what I was feeling. Mm. And, you know, as a Uber Eats driver, I get a lot of time to spend in the car and listen to podcasts and think. And kind of that was one of the... Right. One of the benefits, one of the things I love about it is I'm kind of doing something, yeah. earning money, but also it's given me this chance to mm. kind of decompress, sit still, go through all these things. And so between that, journaling, mm. support, and really learning to sit when it's uncomfortable. I mean, that, that is the key is, you know, any growth is very uncomfortable. And when you, whether it's get a craving or you feel like you're having a slight panic attack an anxiety attack and you need to breathe through it, 
you know, because the last thing you want to do is when you start to understand this um, about yourself, if you're self-aware enough, is that regardless of what it is, you're going to start to understand that you're going to have to sit with it because even for like an anxiety attack, yes, you could be like, I can go to the doctor and they will give you anxiety medicine. And next thing you know, you have a benzodiazepine problem. Mm. And, and so you have to realize that no matter what the solution is never reaching for whatever it is, you're going to have to sit with it. You're going to have to think it through. You're going to have to journal through it. Mm. But, you know, I found putting on a great inspirational podcast or something that helps you learn mm. or something that gets you through a tough time, usually coupled with a nice walk out through nature, some sort of physical activity. Mm. Those things give your brain time to sort it out. And I think they're just very necessary. And getting movement will give you that dopamine hit that you're looking for. Mm when you're starting to feel that discomfort and you would normally reach for a drink or you would normally reach for a pill, getting moving will give you a little bit of dopamine hit and you'll feel a lot better. And those were the tools I, and that I still use. I still do all those mm -hmm. things daily. And, yeah. you know, it's, I still have bad days. It's still a, it's still a process. I mean, um, I hit, I'm one year off of Kratom and next month we'll be one year off of alcohol. So congratulations, brother. I mean, these are Thank amazing you. achievements and the the post-traumatic growth and the, the, the inner work that you have done. Uh, it's beautiful to hear the results. It is as if, if, as if you have planted seeds and they are now all coming out of the earth and in the most beautiful flowers oh wow um so but i still great. have to weed the garden <laughs> <laughs> touche touche because there are a lot of weeds who are very quickly want to overpower everything else quite yes. true oh wow you're an amazing man richard and i'm Thank incredibly you. grateful that you came onto my show that you showed this authenticity this this integrity, this extreme ownership of owning your previous actions and having done the work to explain to yourself why you have acted the way you've acted, but not really excusing that simply, but actually just saying, yes, I know I've stuffed up and you're making amends now. What more can you hope for? What better leadership can you show then what you're exactly doing so if people want to want to know more about you where can they find you well they can find me at the men of the house podcast on instagram tiktok facebook mm -hmm. um and also at bus sprouts so i have a bus sprouts accounts and you can listen to a podcast right through there and there's a mixture of episodes where I interview people, but there's a lot of solo episodes where mm -hmm. you, what's interesting about this is I started this last July and you can go through and you can kind of hear the personal journey and the growth of some of these things I've explained because um, some of the initial workings of the podcast were kind of like a, a verbal journal, if you will. So um, that's where you can find me. And that's probably where you'll find the most authentic version of me is listening to some of those solo episodes. Um, I do not hold back, but I think they're important to hear and mm. you'll, you'll get to know more than you want about me. <laughs> uh, beautiful. Guys, look down there into the description of the YouTube video and of the podcast. All of Richard's details are down there. And whilst you're down there, please press the like and subscribe button, leave a comment uh, on the show, and maybe tell your friends, because I've got the honor and privilege of talking to so many beautiful, fantastic people. And uh, I hope that with each interview, I grow, and that is a fact for me, and I hope also that you get wonderful pieces of, uh, of wisdom, some aha moments that allow you to grow. That's if we all become a little bit better every day, then maybe we can change this world step by step. But we need to start with ourselves. 
Richard, you're an amazing man. Thank you so much for being a guest on my show. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. And you guys out there, live with intention. Bye. I never give up. I never give up. I never give up.